BioBalance HealthCast, episode 182, Creating Super Athletes. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. This week, Kathy and I are going to be talking about an article that we read in the August edition of Men's Journal. The article is entitled, Building the New Super Athlete, How Medical Technology is Reengineering the Human Body for Optimal and Usually Legal uh, Performance. (laughs) And so we want to talk about the things that they're talking about because the research aspect of this is really fascinating because you never know where the unintended consequences go, or maybe even the intended consequences. Mm-hmm. And and as we were preparing to discuss this article, we found ourselves uh, struggling to keep in focus uh, the, the disparate focal points of the article. One of them is the really fascinating medical or scientific experiments that are being done and the new treatments that are being evolved. And the other is a a separate conversation, a separate focal point about the regulatory environment, whether the regulatory environment is the FDA, which regulates food and medicine, uh, or the regulatory environment are the uh, regulatory aspects of the of the various competitive sports arenas like the the national football league or the major league baseball or the olympic uh, competitions uh, committees uh that regulate what athletes can do because there are examples like lance armstrong and what he was doing and some major league baseball pitchers and what they are doing and and the question becomes uh is that an unfair competitive advantage and if so why and how is it something that should be allowed at all are we purist in the sport But my interest, and and I'm not speaking for Mm -hmm. Kathy, my interest is more the kind of things that they're studying. How can that be used by ordinary people to uh, enhance their quality of life or improve their medical conditions Mm -hmm. more than the regulatory aspect of purest competitive sports? Right. We're going to talk about the different different new uh, types of um, advancements in Mm -hmm. the human body, the physiology of the human body. From this article, things right. that we already know, things that we learned by reading this and researching it. But one of the things I'm always concerned about is the fact that oftentimes when the NFL or the baseball league says athletes can't do this, then the FDA goes, ah, it's it's not safe. We have to overregulate it. So when they said athletes can't use testosterone, mm-hmm. then the FDA made it a dangerous drug and then said then people can't get it from their doctor without a lot of hoops to jump over and you have no idea how many hoops we have to jump over to actually obtain testosterone pellets for our patients. Mm-hmm. And every year, it's yet another The regulatory thing environment to becomes do. more restrictive, more controlled, more encompassing. It's bureaucracy and at, the goal at of its that worst. is to not increase safety, at least you, you believe it's not, but to reduce not, capacity. Right. It's, it's a, to make doctors say or find that this is too difficult to get the product, to get the medication, and too risky because now it's considered dangerous. So what's the danger of testosterone? What what is it they say is dangerous about testosterone? Well, that's that's the issue. It was it was an, a non it it made competition in sports not equivalent. Okay. In other words, all right. It made athletes, somebody got an unfair advantage. Right. Athletes had more muscle or they could hit harder or they could they were heavier because they took testosterone, but the danger was for young men who had normal testosterone but wanted to have super normal testosterone okay. and then were given testosterone so that's the wrong patient that should get to that's getting right. testosterone right. young healthy men young healthy men who already have testosterone young, healthy athletes right so so the that's the that's the responsibility of the doctor mm-hmm. so the athlete that is getting this, yeah, they shouldn't get it, but that's the choice of that doctor that chose to write that prescription. Mm-hmm. And that should be the issue, that doctor that wrote the prescription for young, healthy men who don't really need testosterone right. versus aging pe- aging men and women mm-hmm. who need testosterone. So what the FDA made it so easy, oh, we're just going to make this in the category with, with uh, Vicodin. Right. 
Vi Vicodin you can get addicted to. You don't get addicted to testosterone. And it is very well controlled and it is and it it can it's be a sold. natural substance, it's not an artificial substance. Testosterone but is, but Vicodin's not. Right. Testosterone's our own hormone. So so in this, that's my concern is when we start looking at what sports does. Mm -hmm. I start looking down the line at, oh my gosh, they're going to be if this if the athletes are misusing this, right. then we're going to be getting another dictum from the FDA controlling it because athletes shouldn't use it as as an unfair advantage. Yet other people who need it are going to be um, they're they're going to be compromised in getting it or finding a doctor who will do it. Right. Because of the headlines. So, so do you think it's an example of a nanny state, or do you think it's an, uh, a legitimate concern about safety that ju they, they just brought too big a hammer to the table? I think they're, they're playing doctor. I mean, doctors are supposed to make the decision on whether somebody should have a medication or not. And that's why we're trained. Otherwise, we could just be anybody uh, following the rules on the computer. Right. But that's not what we do. And we're trained lots of years, many, many years of sacrifice time to be that that doctor, but this is nanny doctor. They're trying to play doctor and, and control what we can give to our patients. Well, another example of that, and we've talked about it in several of our podcasts, is the FDA deciding that too many people in America are on uh, attention deficit drugs. And so they restrict the amount that the, the manufacturers can produce. Which is ridiculous. Instead of saying to the doctors, Tighten up your qualifiers. Are mm -hmm. you doing a good job? Mm -hmm. I mean, it should be the doctors are the one that have to write the prescription, that have to uh, talk to me and look at me and test me and say, you know what, you need this medicine, so I'm going to write a prescription. You do that. Mm -hmm. Then I go to the pharmacy, and the pharmacy says, well, we don't have any, and we don't know where we're going to get any because mm -hmm. the manufacturers aren't making this much because the FDA so says they did they an end run. They did. So is the so but that's what they the do is they operation. then control. The, they couldn't control the doctors because the doctors had a good diagnosis of. ADD or whatever they're using this right. this drug for, right. so they did an end run around and said to the pharmaceutical companies, "No, you can't make this." So, so when when I'm looking at everything that is approved or not approved for sports, and this is what they're doing for women with testosterone. Right, they're not for doing it for men. They can make it for men. Right, but they're saying women. It's not safe for them, so we won't let you make but it for them. It's not safe because it causes facial hair. We're not talking a beard here. We're which, just talking facial hair, which most women have when they're young. And that's a cosmetic anyway, concern. That's a cosmetic. It's not a, it's not a health. Concern. There is nothing that testosterone is going to do besides if it's over if it's overdosed or you have a, a laryngeal injury, it could slightly decrease your uh, the tone of your voice or the pitch of your voice. Mm -hmm. But that rarely happens. That's not really dangerous, mm -hmm. doesn't impair your life, mm -hmm. doesn't cause cancer, doesn't kill you. Does, none of these things are things that impair your life. So it's not dangerous right. to women. And it's really not dangerous to men if it's given in the proper dose. So why is it controlled like Vicodin, which you could overdose on right. and die? Right. So that that's my issue. And that's why I always look at this and go, oh, no, they're controlling something else for the athletes. We're not going to be able to well, provide that for, for instance, regular patients. You and I know people, ordinary people, not super athletes, who have attempted to make use of this next uh, technology that we're going mm -hmm. to talk about. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of interesting research that's being done. And people are saying, oh, my gosh, this really has great potential. Mm -hmm. But because some athletes are doing it to enhance their competitive performance or to uh, lengthen their competitive performance their, when yeah, they've been injured. Their life of working. Uh, there's a question about regulation that will be looked at by professional sports. And your concern is those dominoes may fall again. If professional sports regulates it, then the FDA may come in and say, oh, we need to regulate it. And there's an example of where they've done that. And, and what we're talking about is the use of your own stem cells. If they can draw your stem cells out of your body, natural substance created in your body by you, your substance, treat it and inject it back into your body. By treating it, uh, what I mean they generally right factors. now, they spin it out. They spin and, it out and spin and out the extraneous uh, stuff like fat. Well, they spin out the red cells and they spin out, I mean, they just take stem cells. So they just so take, they the just stem take cells. that and they spin out white cells and they spin out, uh, they also take platelets in a different sample. Right. So they will they will take it out of your body, spin it, put it into a syringe. 
They spin in a centrifuge. Yeah. That forces all those things to separate they out. They separate into layers. They can, because they're different weights, they can pull the stem cells. Right. And, and then, then they, they inject the pure stem cell back into you. Into for the some. joint. They don't inject it like a shot. They in, put it mm -hmm. into your joints or your muscles where there's a muscle spasm or damage. And those stem cells are what's called multipotential cells. Usually they're a, they're uh, retrieved from the fat. They usually suck out a little fat. Right. So that's basically where it comes from. And then when they get the pure stem cells, they inject it into your joint or your muscle when you're you have a damaged joint. So, so the stem cells are basic building blocks, and and mm -hmm. in the fetus, they evolve into things like bone or muscle or tissue. But we have them uh, throughout our life, and fewer of them as we get older. Right. And fewer of them as we use. As, as our bodies get worn out. So mm -hmm. they have to be concentrated and put in a place where they can heal. So uh, my husband had this done. It was injected into his his knee for three years. Uh, we had multiple injections into his knee, and it built his cartilage back up. Mm -hmm. It didn't prevent him from getting a uh, partial knee replacement eventually because at some point, if you're still putting so much pressure on a joint that's abnormal, you'll still have to have the surgery, but it delayed it long enough so that the new technique or the new um, mm -hmm. knee could come out and we could get a better replacement. So that was so you worth time. it. We bought yeah. some time of pain free. Pain free, <laughs> pain -free time. How, right. how much is that worth? Yeah, and that's you worth know, a lot. Yeah. And, and he still ended up with, with the knee replacement. Here they're talking about a pitcher who had an injury of his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And he was given stem cells taken from his own body, spun down, and activated with some growth factors, put back into his shoulder to help him heal faster. Now, to me, that sounds like injecting cortisone when you have too much inflammation or something like that, but, that, but this is your own cells. Well, but as I understand it uh, from reading this article, the FDA's contention about that was that intervening step of adding growth factor right. uh, to, to enhance the mm -hmm. speed of the growth. What, they, what they're still allowing is if you spin out the fat, you don't do anything to enhance it, mm -hmm. and you put it right back into to the body. put the stem cells right back. The in. stem cells. Then that can still be done, although mm -hmm. they're looking at that. Right, and, and I'm what, afraid they're going to look at that and say... And that's your concern. That's my concern. That's right. the next step, and that is saving people so much. I mean, I have arthritis in my hands from years of delivering babies right. and surgery, and I've had stem cells injected into my thumb. I don't have to have surgery on my thumb. Right. So, and I've had, yeah, and I'm going to have stem cells injected into the other one. use of your own stem cells, just, there are so many things that people are looking at to say, would that be helpful for me or my child uh, with this condition that mm -hmm. they have? And, and it's really something that if you read about this, uh, it's just blossoming. And it's been out there for about 10 years, and, and now you can, it's usually found in uh, the anti-aging anti doctors or the integrative right. medicine doctors are doing this. We don't do it because we have several doctors in, in the city, in St. Louis, who You're are great at that. it. That's right. all they do. Know. So yeah. we do the hormones, they do the stem cells, right. and so that's what they do. And, and they have really helped many of my patients. Well, the doctor that was working with this picture, though, uh, the FDA came in and said, you can't, they shut him down. You can't do this. Because you're manipulating that, and it's no longer his pure stuff. And so what he did is move his clinic to the Cayman Islands. Mm -hmm. And now the pitcher goes to the Cayman Islands and lays on the beach for a week and gets it done. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's still getting it done. And they haven't decided, the, and, and that's the FDA, but the, um, and the baseball NF, NFL or say, the NBA have not, uh, excuse me, the yeah. uh, Baseball Association has not decided whether that's um, an at a... Um, Inequality. I mean, it, is it giving competitive a, a advantage. comparative advantage? Yeah. Excuse me. I'm the one having the trouble. So, with so that's time. a second regulatory concern, and that's not a governmental agency, but that's a sports body agency, and they have their own concerns about right. that. Right. But to me, stem cells is healing. It's and healing a joint. I mean, you don't want to take. We it use away other from medication. People. Can we not take? Yeah. Give the. Right. That's kind of like. Well, then I guess we shouldn't give cortisone shots. And I guess there's many things that we do for athletes because. They have an unnatural amount of trauma to their bodies. Wear and tear, yeah. Right, and so why is it wrong to make them better? Yeah. Health, healthier, excuse me. Well, this is a but again, healthier I, healing I don't thing. think the argument is about making them better. I think it's about giving them an unfair competitive advantage. 
Well, that's a so fine line. That's, it is a fine line. And your concern is that in attempting to draw that fine line, they will just simply get the big hammer and say, nobody can have it. Right. Because we and can't And I'm concerned about the athletes as well. Yeah. Because yes, you would be. Because the athletes are being prevented from having something that could actually heal their injury. Yeah. Now, what's wrong with healing an injury? Mm -hmm. I don't find the problem. As a physician, that's my job. Heal the injury. And, if it's, with, and if it's without too much risk. If, and if this it's post-injury, I don't think many people would disagree with you. But what if it's pre-injury just for competitive performance? Well, that's not what has been discussed here. It right. doesn't. They're not using it for that. Right. Stem cells haven't been used for that. Okay. So then so, let's go to so a different to thing the, that's yeah. less controversial. Yes. Uh, biofeedback training. And what they're what the article is talking about is they're using biofeedback training to enhance focus concentration. Like if you're a competitive tennis player and you lose some of your focusing attention in a six hour match, mm -hmm. uh, that if you could find a way to train yourself to stay focused or to refocus, mm -hmm. that would help you stay in the match and be more competitive. Mm -hmm. And, and actually, I can see that being a competitive, competitive advantage or just a, uh, an advantage for people that have ADD. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of taking a drug, could mm -hmm. they use a biofeedback mm -hmm. system? Uh, or for stressed executives mm -hmm. or for people that have Prevent to like Prevent a stroke. Doctors. Prevent high blood pressure. Absolutely. I mean, well, like if you're, a, me, if you're a, a surgeon and you're in the hospital on a 24-hour shift, uh -huh. <clears throat> and if 20 hours in, your mind is saturated um, mm -hmm. from emergency room trauma of, of an impactful day. What if you could take a 10-minute biofeedback session to reset your mind? To make you a better doctor to the be rest a sharper, of the time. Yeah. yeah. Would I that mean, be a thing that we want to promote and use? And, and I don't see a problem in that. I mean, that if there's, no, if there's not a downside in, in uh, decision-making, because yeah. that's what doctors really are, is decision-makers, and you have to be able to have – to be creative in your treatment to mm -hmm. handle anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, if it didn't impair that, if it made that better, I don't, and there was no downside and I don't know, I don't ever see any downside to biofeedback that that, that would be a really good thing yeah. if people would use it. And you know, we have, there are uh, apps on your phone that you can get these different waves that'll right. calm you down or wake you up or, right. you know, help you be better at your job. And those are, those are actually very effective. It's not exactly biofeedback, but, mm -hmm. but it's a, um, it's, it's sounds that make your neurotransmitters uh, at top, at top uh, secretion and, and for the it's, kind of secretion. It's fascinating stuff. And, and it's, hard to globalize the results. I mean, if you're sitting in front of a biofeedback machine, you can absolutely see somebody play with, through the power of their mind, the program on the computer. Uh, the example in the story is with the tennis mm -hmm. player, he's watching sort of a video game, and when he's in the right zone, when his, uh, his neural... Uh, energy bursts are in the right wavelength, then the picture on the computer screen is alive and active. And mm -hmm. when he gets distracted mm -hmm. and those wavelengths change away from optimal functioning, then the picture goes dim. Mm -hmm. So you can see that and he's learning what it feels like to be in that zone mm -hmm. and he's learning to intentionally throw that switch. And they don't know how he's learning it. They don't mm -hmm. know what the uh, mechanism of operation is. They can just see the results. Uh, but when you unplug him and send him out to play for six hours, is he going to be able to use it? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Is he going to be too distracted doing what he's doing to get the biofeedback? Yeah. But they've done that. I mean, there have been studies on that, uh, like uh, guided imagery, where they mm -hmm. teach basketball players eye movements for rehearsing uh, free throws. Mm -hmm. and, and you stand and you visualize through the sequence of eye movements the perfect free throw. Mm -hmm. And then you open your eyes and you shoot the basket. And they they have that's what they're doing when they shut their eyes. Okay, that's well, that's what some of them are doing because they've been trained to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a mindset thing of relaxing your body, getting focus. You know, if you watch basketball games, they have all these sound yeah. uh, noisemakers behind the basket mm -hmm. trying to distract the player. He's supposed to just zone out and make it all go away. And mm -hmm. all you know, it's a be the ball kind of thing. And mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. They've been doing that on their own. They have forever. Absolutely. And that's part of the game. And this is certainly not an unfair advantage. It's just learning. What kind? What kind of uh, power you have within? Yeah, and so, so it's like for a you know an aging 
non-basketball player, is there something that I could benefit from mm -hmm. if I need, if I know I need to really be focused for the next two or three hours? If I could teach myself to meditate or breathe or use biofeedback, mm -hmm. would it that be would better? Be, that would be ideal. And, yeah. the, and the fact that they're studying the athletes makes this, makes this a good study for us. Yes. They're studying the athletes, the ath athletic community's paying for this, I assume. They're leading and the way. Yeah, yeah they're it's, it's legal. developing I mean, the technology and the equipment. This is not an illegal thing. Yeah. This, is, this is something that is just probably what they should all do in terms of making themselves focus well but and, and be better at the game. However, uh, this is also a benefit to us because Absolutely. as they go through this research, we're finding things that we can use in different creative ways in real life. Serendipity. A absolutely. And, and there, there's more. And there, the other things that we want to talk about are a little less well-known, a little newer and more experimental uh, than biofeedback and stem cell research. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've run out of time, so we'll have to ask you to come back for our next podcast and hear about the rest of these techniques that are being used. Okay, we'll see you then. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.